Greetings and salutations loyal viewers of this channel. Today we are going to be discussing the Adnan Saeed case and particularly the new update which is that Heyman Lee, the victim, the woman that Adnan decided to strangle to death and dump in Lincoln Park, her family, specifically her brother, has retained counsel and is now filing an appeal to put Adnan Saeed back where he belongs, which is in prison. Now, in my previous video, we went over the generalities about the overall campaign in order to free Adnan. I talked about how he had lost every single appeal that they brought up because all of his ridiculous claims have been heard in a court of law and have been adjudicated and they all came out against him. However, the strategy in order to free Adnan, as we've seen time and time again with the Innocence Fraud Movement, is essentially to go to the media, give one side of the story, and then hope that you out there in the audience are dumb enough to believe and never even think about the other side. And the person behind this media campaign is a woman called Rabia Ochandri, and she is Adnan's childhood friend she's also an attorney and she has made a bank off of this case she has a best-selling book she's actually the one who fed the story to the serial podcast that gave this story national attention and she was behind the hbo documentary series which was a propaganda series on behalf of adnan that specifically was designed to make him look as good as possible make him look as innocent as possible while ignoring the key pieces of evidence and presenting evidence that had already been knocked down on appeal. Now, I didn't do a deep dive into the particular idiotic claims brought forward. I thought it should be obvious that this person is guilty because he's the only person with motive. I showed you the letter where he wrote, I'm going to kill. We went over the testimony, which showed exactly what Jay lied about, who was the key witness in the case, but more importantly, what he told the truth about, the key details related to the case that only somebody involved could know. And we talked about briefly how cell phone records records actually place Adnan at the burial site and in fact the cell phone records show far more than I let on in that previous video however this is a point of contention that idiots in my comments have been leaving me because this is something that has been brought up in every single documentary it has been brought up in the podcast that supposedly the cell phone records aren't this magic bullet that you think it is the cell phone records I don't know if you know this I don't know if you're aware of this actually don't prove what was alleged to have been proved in a court of law and in fact they actually got an employee from AT&T that testified in the trial of Adnan to say that had he known what he know now he probably would have testified a little bit differently now all of these claims are ridiculous all of these claims are absurd and all of these claims are not even internally consistent which i will go over in great detail right at this very moment first and foremost what this claim is based on is that basically when the cell phone records were faxed over to the police it came attached with one piece of paper that said that the cell phone location data is not as reliable on incoming calls as it is on outgoing calls this one piece of paper is the basis for calling into question the entirety of the cell phone record data because the Lincoln Park calls which are the burial site calls actually are incoming calls not outgoing calls therefore therefore that proves that it's totally unreliable totally nonsensical therefore therefore Adnan Saeed is innocent let him out oh my god travesty of justice Islamophobic justice system there we go slam dunk we nailed it so first and foremost this is not true but I will get into that a little bit later but presuming that this is in fact true and coincidentally Adnan's phone for no particular reason decided to ping in a cell tower that almost exclusively covers Lincoln Park which happens to be the burial site of Heyman Lee the girl that Adnan Saeed strangled to death by the way because she broke up with him and he didn't like that that is not the beginning and the end of the story because you see there's actually an outgoing call at eight o'clock because the burial calls all happen about around 7 10 or 7 15 and that outgoing call came from the disposal site of Heyman Lee's vehicle so even if you presume for some reason incoming calls are not accurate according to this theory that does not account for the 804 phone call which was of course at the disposal site of the vehicle and again is an outgoing call 
Now, to address the claim that incoming calls are somehow invalid in terms of location data, we should actually look to the specific hearing where this was adjudicated because it turns out that piece of paper that says that incoming calls are less reliable or not reliable or whatever doesn't appear to have a known author. Nobody knows where this claim comes from. And in fact, Serial, which is the podcast that popularized this claim, which by the way, the host of Serial is actually the character that Tina Fey is based on in the show Only Murders in the Building, just so you know, actually went in and looked into this and they reached out to experts and all the experts came back and said the following. There is no distinction between cell tower location data for incoming and outgoing calls. Quote, finally, Dana ran the disclaimer past a couple of cell phone experts, the same guys who had reviewed at our request all the cell phone testimony from Adnan's trial. And they said, as far as the science goes, it should not matter incoming or outgoing. It shouldn't change which tower the phone uses. Uses. Maybe it was an idiosyncrasy to do with AT&T's records keeping, the expert said. But again, for the location data, it shouldn't make a difference whether the call was going out or coming in. So even the podcast that originally brought this to the forefront that was originally advocating for this when they reached out to experts found nothing to validate this on top of that you actually had another expert show up to court to testify to the validity of this and unlike the expert that testified in Adnan's regular local trial this is a national expert who is renowned for his expertise and he happens to have the last name Fitzgerald which means for sure he's a hundred percent trustworthy and despite the fact that the defense was trying to do dirty tricks during the course of this hearing he proved his expertise by seeing through them in real time you see one of the tactics that the defense attorney tried to use because this is the tactic for adnan saeed's whole defense is to present a doctored form of the phone records to the expert witness which he identified as a doctored form of the phone records and called him out in real time and we'll go to the quotes just so you can hear how devastating this was for the defense. The quote from Chad Fitzgerald, It is offensive that you handed me manipulated evidence and tried to undermine my expertise. I figured out what you are doing and I think you got caught in your own game. Now, of course, Brown, the attorney for Saeed, ended up pleading ignorance saying, Whoa, 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 I didn't intentionally hand you a doctor piece of information. This happened to be what I had in my file and I... Obviously, this means that the documents were just not turned over properly to the defense, so honestly, it proves my case. Now, this is ridiculous and absurd for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the trial happened in the year 2000, so even if that was the case, the actual phone records were entered into evidence during the course of that trial. We're in the appeal phase at this point. It's 16 years later when this hearing happened, and Brown is saying that 16 years later, even though anybody can download the transcripts of the file of the court and look at them, he somehow, as Adnan's attorney, just happened to have this doctored version and accidentally presented it and didn't question it. These are the same people, by the way, who say that their own people can determine that these cell phone records are unreliable because, for whatever reason, they're just unreliable. Look at this piece of paper we got from AT&T with no author and no expert to back it up up even the experts reached out to by the serial podcast which was totally on Adnan's side because they got the story fed to them by Rabia so the cell phone evidence 100% shows Adnan's guilty the distinction between incoming and outgoing calls is not a distinction that matters there is no evidence to support that and no expert will certify what was presented on that piece of paper in a court of law because it's absurd the idea that they can't find out your location or somehow the towers work differently when you dial out versus dialing in is nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. And on top of that, nobody denies that Adnan was with Jay that day. And the reason they can't deny that is because the calls before the burial of the body actually indicate that Adnan answered and the calls were for Jay from Jay's friends. And he said, Jay will call you back. Nobody denies this account of events. Nobody denies the location data either before or after, whether it's incoming or outgoing calls. The only location data that is being denied 
in the appeal process by Adnan's defense team is the location data between 7 p.m. and 9 p.m. So everything's 100% accurate according to the defense and according to the prosecution. This is what they agree on after 9 p.m. and before 7 p.m. But what is in dispute supposedly is the location data between 7 and 9 p.m. And of course, there is an outgoing call from where they dumped the car of Heyman Lee. So this point is moot even if you just have happen to believe for some reason it just coincidentally two different times ping the tower that covers exclusively Lincoln Park where we know for a fact Heyman Lee was buried obviously this is nothing to make any case about on top of that in the appellate process in that 2016 appeal that was brought forward they were arguing for ineffective counsel for the most part so even the defense team knew that their claims about the cell phone evidence were likely not going anywhere so of course they presented a woman called asia mclean now we talked about her specifically in my previous video but asia mclean is somebody who two people have signed sworn statements alleging she told back in the day that she would end up lying for ad because she believed Adnan was guilty and in fact she was actually brought forward in a previous hearing in 2010 in order to testify and her 2016 testimony and what she's brought forward in the documentaries and in the serial podcast claims that the reason she didn't testify that she saw Adnan in the library in and around the time of the murder was because the prosecutor convinced her that the evidence against Adnan was overwhelming, therefore she decided not to testify. I figured with him being a prosecutor that he would be a reliable source for information and I gave him a call and I actually took notes on the conversation. I told him that I saw Saeed in the library in 1999. He told me that they had cell phone records and they had a witness that confessed to helping him bury Hay. And then I wrote down something Yurik said to me directly. If I had any doubt that Anand didn't kill Hay, it would be my moral obligation to see that he didn't serve any time. Based on what he told me, I felt that the conviction was, you know, airtight. And so I didn't see the need for me to get involved 10 years later. Now, I want you to really pause for a second for station identification and maybe think about what that actually means. According to Asia McLean, in 2010, even though she knows for sure that she saw Adnan Saeed at the date of the murder, at the time of the murder, allegedly in the library and she had a conversation with him for 15 minutes and that conversation is something she committed to memory a prosecutor was able to convince her not to testify to that even though she's a hundred percent sure that happened based on cell phone location data now ask yourself if you had a conversation with somebody somebody who you were writing letters to in prison somebody who was your close friend somebody that you respected somebody that you likely had a crush on which by the way goes to the underlying motivation behind her actions then why wouldn't you testify if somebody showed you some cell phone records that may have disabused you of the notion that he was innocent if you did have this conversation if you knew for sure that you talked to this person in and around the time of the murder then why wouldn't you still testify because that conversation obviously happened and you shouldn't be scared off by all this so-called evidence because obviously that evidence has to be wrong. Asia McLean's excuse for not testifying in the 2010 appeal makes no sense. There's a reason why she only came forward in and around the time of the serial podcast because they were working this woman for years to go back to her original lies about Adnan Saeed. That the a young lady named Asia called me. And um, what did she say? She was concerned because she was being asked questions about an affidavit she'd written back at the time of the trial. She told me that she'd only written it because she was getting pressure from the family and she basically wrote it to please them and get them off her back. So to be clear, the cell phone data is in fact reliable. All the assertions to the contrary are not backed up by any expert testimony. The only thing backing this is one piece of paper that nobody can determine the author of and every expert that has reviewed this says that there's no technological difference between how a tower would perform in 
isn't an incoming call versus an outgoing call. The Lincoln Park Tower, which is where Heyman Lee's body was in fact buried, does cover that area and little more than that area. So obviously, they were in the park that day in the location where Heyman Lee was in fact buried. On top of that, if you still don't believe it, if you believe this piece of paper over every expert and you somehow don't want to call into question every single other case that relies on this same data, which has been validated and put forward at trial time and time again, I mean, that's on you. You got to think about the broader implications of what you're claiming. There is, in fact, an outgoing call at the dump site of the car shortly after the burial of Heyman Lee. So we have the calls that put Adnan and Jay together at the burial site. We have people who testified that they were together that day. We have people who called and said that they were looking for Jay because Jay had the phone. Adnan picked up, said Jay will call you back. And we have the location data that ties this all together. So even absent the testimony of Jay Wilds, the cell phone data tells the tale. On top of that, as brought up in my previous video, originally the defense team for Adnan was going to go with the argument that Adnan was at mosque all evening and they actually had 80 witnesses that were going to testify that Adnan was totally at the mosque. I showed the list of names on screen so you can see it, but let me read you this motion to inform the prosecution what the defense is going to do so you can hear it for yourself. Dear Mr. Eric, again, this is the prosecutor. These witnesses will be used to support the defendant's alibi as follows. On January 13th, 1999, that is the date of the murder, Adnan Masood Saeed attended Woodlawn High School for the duration of the school day. This isn't true, by the way. At the conclusion of the school day, the defendant remained at the high school until the beginning of his track practice. After track practice, Adnan Saeed went home and remained there until attending services at the mosque in the evening. These witnesses will testify as to the defendant's regular attendance to school, track practice, and the mosque, and that his absence on January 13th, 1999 would have been noticed. And then there's a list of about 80 people, none of which who testified in a court of law after it was proven that they would be perjuring themselves. Now, the reason I bring this up in particular is because part of the innocence fraud campaign relies heavily on smearing the Korean community as not caring about Heyman Lee, smearing the family of Heyman Lee, and depicting them as bloodthirsty monsters who wanted revenge for previous victimization since this happened in and around Baltimore that happened to their community. Cheered Syed's efforts for a new trial, the family of Heyman Lee, has not, saying in a February statement, it remains hard to see so many run to defend someone who committed a horrible crime, who destroyed our family, who refuses to accept responsibility when so few are willing to speak up for hay. Now, the clip that I'm about to show actually features Koreans speaking Korean, and it's subtitled. So for my blind viewers on Apple's podcasting platform and on Spotify, I will be doing the dub so you can understand what's being said. So this is Sun Hee Lee speaking. She is described by the documentary as a family friend of Hae Min Lee. <laughs> When this happened to Hei Min, at the time we thought, this is something that we can't let go. As a community, in order to protect our kids, we need to demonstrate and protest. So then they go to a man called Park Ki Chan, that will be the male Korean voice that you're hearing, and he is the editor-in-chief at Korea Daily, which is the local paper and the only one available at the time of the murder to Koreans in the Korean language. This person here is Hei Min's younger brother. Back then, the Baltimore area had a Korean population of around 20,000. Koreans had one daily newspaper, and a lot of Koreans were small business owners. Delis, carryouts, liquor stores, convenience stores. Besides these jobs, there were no other jobs available for us. Normally, you would have to work 15 hours a day. So you provide for your children. Koreans generally worked own stores in dangerous areas of Baltimore. There were a lot of robberies and murders. 
I remember Joel Lee's murder in 1993. Four eyewitnesses said this man, Davon Neverdon, held up and then shot and killed this college student, Joel Lee. But Neverdon was acquitted. We want justice! We want justice! Joel Lee died twice by two murderers. One was Neverdon, and another was the legal system of this country. Oh. So the Korean community united and protested unfair judgments. Tonight, a community comes together to protest the death of a Korean grocer who was killed at his East Baltimore store. Immediately following the funeral service, members of the Korean American community will join a special motorcade around the city. The hearse will be driven by several of the crime scenes and encircle City Hall. Some of the people in these cars are calling this a protest. Others are calling it a motorcade. But no matter what it is called, it is meant to send a message. We feel we were victimized again and again and again. Oh, sure, arrest me, so what? What, what after that? They, they go free. We want results. The headline is when Hei Min Lee's body was found. It was our first story on a front page article. Lee's family wants justice, closure to the saddest loss of their lives. He should get what he deserves for doing this. All we wanted was for that kid to be convicted. What's insane about this section of the docu-series is essentially they lay out case after case of Koreans being victimized and the perpetrator walking free despite the fact that there's overwhelming evidence to convict them and they use this as a smear against the Korean community to make it seem like they all wanted revenge against Adnan and they juxtaposed that to footage of them having candlelight vigils, talking about the victims, emphasizing the victims, coming together as a community and demanding justice, not revenge. This is a sick, disgusting smear against the Korean community and unfortunately, this is not the first nor will it be the last because the smears go on. And here you have, right here, an entire community of people, mostly attendees at the mosque, coming forward, willing to lie for Adnan, even though he's facing murder charges, and only backing down when they were informed that their testimony would clearly and obviously be proven false in a court of law. So let's be clear, Adnan Saeed murdered Heyman Lee, he strangled her to death, he dumped her body in Lincoln Park, and the cell phone records back this up. Adnan was very angry at her. We went over the letter in the last video and Adnan writing, I'm going to kill on that letter. And on top of that, he was actually contacted and became a suspect in part because he asked Heyman Lee for a ride that day and he was the last person known to see her alive. Adnan had his own car. He claimed that he needed the ride because his car was in the shop. Then his car was not in the shop. Then he claimed he didn't need the ride or didn't ask for the ride because he has his own car. All of these machinations of the stories show the inconsistencies in what he's put forward this whole time. He killed her because she dumped him and moved on. He was very angry about it. Everybody knew Adnan was very angry about it. At one point, a school official had to hide Heyman Lee from Adnan. On top of that, there was an anonymous tip informing the police that Adnan used to take Heyman Lee in and around Lincoln Park so he knew the area in order to hook up with her. And the reason I bring this up is because we talked early on about how the family is filing the appeal because they weren't even granted a real chance to show up to the hearing and this whole campaign has been smearing them. Well, now they're actually smearing the brother of Heyman Lee as the anonymous tipster, even though the anonymous tipster clearly is somebody who knew Adnan from within his own community because he described relationships with Adnan and his friends. Now, this is from Amy Berg. She's the director of The Case Against Adnan Saeed, the HBO propaganda docuseries, accusing Heyman Lee's brother of calling in the anonymous tip when we have overwhelming evidence to the contrary. I don't know what type of racism exists currently, but as we discovered in the hashtag case against Adnan Saeed, the tip that Adnan did it was called in by somebody of Asian descent, not S Asian, meaning South Asian confirmed. I often wondered if it was Young Lee, this is the brother of Heyman Lee, who called in the tip himself. 
he was so young. Now, the caller, by the way, is in fact identified as a male 18 to 21. And of course, this does not match the description of young Lee. On top of knowing where they would hook up from time to time, something that Heyman Lee's brother likely wouldn't know because she was keeping the relationship a secret from her family, this anonymous caller also brought up one of Adnan's friends and how he was told that Adnan if he ever hurt his girlfriend, would basically put her car into a lake. So Adnan would talk about hurting his girlfriend if she ever stepped out of line before. This caller was clearly not the brother because he had names and home phone numbers of Adnan's associates, and he gave the tip about Adnan. Obviously, this was somebody that he was hanging out with that wanted to turn in the tip, and I wish this person would come forward so we would know the breadth of it, but it's totally and wildly inappropriate for somebody who put together a propaganda film that smears the Koreans as racist, that smears Hae Min Lee's family, to randomly, when we all know this is inaccurate, decide to accuse the brother of calling in the anonymous tip, thus participating in the framing, when all he's doing is filing an appeal because Mosby, the district attorney that's a lame duck district attorney, was on her way out and decided that she was just going to file an appeal based on the defense and get a vacation of conviction, even though Adnan lost each and every appeal. It shouldn't be on the brother in order to fight back against this corrupt innocence fraud system, but it is on the brother. And the response to this, because this brother is the only person who speaks English in Heyman Lee's direct line of family, her parents don't speak English, is for her to throw out to her followers that the brother is now in on the framing of Adnan. Everybody's in on the framing of Adnan. For some reason, everybody wanted to get this 17-year-old guy because everybody hates Adnan. I don't know if you know this, Islamophobia. I don't know if you know this, but Rabia, the person who's behind this propaganda campaign, she experienced domestic violence violence in her relationship. I don't know if you guys know this, but Adnan's mother actually diagnosed with leukemia. What does this have to do with the case? of Adnan killing Heyman Lee? Absolutely nothing, but all this stuff pollutes this person's documentary, and now she exposes her true colors by accusing Heyman Lee's brother of participating in the frame job. On top of that, Amy Berg also doesn't think that Heyman Lee's family should have any representation at all. She put out tweets attacking the attorney, the victim advocate attorney, because he's a used car salesman. He's not presentable, and when you make propaganda films, by the way, when you you're trying to show this glitz and glamour around Adnan's life, you're looking for people to be cast properly in their roles, not looking for the truth. So the people that are supposedly objectively looking at the evidence, even though they get all their information from Adnan's advocate, somebody who profits off of this innocence fraud, Rabia, is now saying that Heyman Lee's brother is in on the frame job of Adnan because we know that the brother definitely wouldn't want the real killer caught. He would just want to frame some random Muslim guy but also he's not entitled to representation and it's kind of the worst part about this whole process that his victim rights attorney actually gets to speak up on behalf of the victim because they try to rig this process as best as possible so he couldn't appear in the hearing which actually did happen he was not able to appear in that hearing to speak up on behalf of his sister when the prosecution was throwing the case so yeah let's be 100% clear Adnan Saeed is 100% guilty the fact that these people are profiting off of these lies, the fact that they're releasing trailers about their new true crime podcast, Rabia's going to do true crime. She's going to do this to other victims' families. The fact that not just the HBO docuseries director, but this entire campaign has been mercilessly smearing members of Heyman Lee's family over and over again just because they're inconvenient because, you know, the family focuses way too much on the person that was murdered in this situation and we're trying to make some money to try to get the murderer out of jail because, you know, honestly, he's such a great guy and these freaking people in the family keep talking about their sister and their daughter and how much they loved her and how much the Korean community 
community cared about her, and we really can't tolerate that. So we got to smear the Koreans as evil racists. We got to smear the brother as participating in the framing of Adnan, and we got to smear the family as not caring about her, as noted in my previous video. It's horrible. It's terrible. These people are monsters. Stop giving them money. Don't listen to this crappy podcast. Look at this trailer. Tell me you're all about it, and I'll tell you, you don't belong on this channel. Now, finally, I will point out that the DNA claims are also absurd. The reason why the defense wants DNA tested, even though this is not a DNA case, is because it is inarguable that at some point in time, Adnan Saeed was in Heyman Lee's car. They actually used to date. They know for a fact that DNA doesn't come with a timestamp. It doesn't come with a date. So if they find Adnan's DNA in there, they're going to say that's not proof of anything because we have a reason for him to be in the car. However, if they find Heyman Lee's current boyfriend's DNA in there, all of a sudden you're going to hear about how that DNA proves that this person is the killer, even though unlike Adnan, he actually has a legitimate alibi. If they find the DNA of members of Heyman Lee's family, maybe they'll smear the father or the mother. You know they were in the car. You know the brother was in the car. Maybe we'll hear about how the brother is suddenly the killer because that's what these people are all about. The DNA is a distraction, and if they find Adnan's DNA in the car, they're not going to say that proves anything and on top of that they want to test random pieces of garbage that were located somewhere in the park where Heyman Lee was buried now this park is huge they're looking at random pieces of garbage that have no connection to the crime scene including a condom wrapper there's no evidence of sexual assault but they're testing a condom because they're trying to find some kind of DNA to say that somebody did something even though this was a straight up strangling by the ex-boyfriend because he was angry about the breakup we have multiple witnesses that acknowledge that this is a fact. We have threats of him saying that he's going to kill Heyman Lee. We have people who had other conversations with him saying that if he were to hurt his girl, this is how he would do it. And it's quite similar. This is who Adnan is. He killed his ex-girlfriend because she dumped him, because she wanted him to leave him alone, because she moved on. He choked her out and dumped her in a burial site that he has a connection to. The cell phone records show it. And then they just disposed of the car and he's been feigning innocence all the way and all these people have lined up to lie for him despite the fact that the case against him is bulletproof what happened here was an absolute travesty of justice it was justice via the internet justice via the twitterati justice via podcast which is no justice at all and a guilty man is walking free and we all need to support Heyman lee's family who shouldn't have to retain their own counsel because the state should be representing them in their fight to get this monster back in prison anyway that's all i really have for you guys today thank you so much for watching if you like this video show by leaving a like subscribe for more content follow me on all my social media support me via the support links in the description box of this video this has been me talking about adnan saeed being 100 percent guilty refuting and destroying all this supposed evidence till next time